Um, now for something completely different, basically. So you've heard, I think, fantastic talks from, from Dan and Jerome uh, about some of the, the really amazing potential, particularly for narrative kinds of experiences and games, and that's not what I do at all. So I'm gonna talk about something, something different. So hopefully that's a good thing. Um, and what I really want to talk about is this year, um, because this year was a real turning point uh, in my relationship to video games. Um, and the reason for that is that I started making them, uh, basically. And I wanna talk about what that experience was like. Uh, so first, a little bit of, of context. Oh, that's right, I've gotta do this two laptops thing, so we'll see how that goes. Um, primarily, I want to, to talk as a person who makes games uh, today. So I've made seven games so far this year, so you can already see there's sort of a different sort of attitude to making games here. And I've got two more that I'm working on, hoping to get out by the end of the year. So making a lot of games. Um, I also teach at the IT University of Copenhagen in the Center for Computer Games Research. And I teach particularly a course called Experimental Interaction. Uh, where I'm interested in pushing students towards doing different things with games. So other possibilities for what you could be doing when you interact with the game. And to expand their minds, uh, as all good education should. Um, along with that, I am kind of have been positioned more as a game critic for, for most of my time with video games. So I did my PhD on games and a sort of a more theoretical topic, which was the role of human values in video games. Uh, and then I've, I've been writing a blog for a long time, analyzing popular games in particular, and just wrote a book that's, uh, that's coming out soon. Um, but for today, I want to talk as a person who sits at his uh, dining table in his apartment uh, in a singlet in this photograph and um, makes games on his computer. Uh, and that's the, the main thing I want to bring to this, is thinking about what that is, uh, what that's like. Um, but the main thing that you kind of uh, get from this so far, I guess, uh, about my life is it's all about games. It's like games, games, games for the last 10 years or so. Uh, and one thing that happens uh, when, you play a lot, when you play a lot of popular games especially uh, is that you start to worry about the state of games. And I think we've heard this expressed very well by... Uh, by both Dan and Jerome is like, what's going on? Why are we always doing the same things? Why am I still hitting this guy on the head with a club, you know, 10 years later? You know, and what is changing? And what can we do? Uh, and the problem there is basically that contemporary games in particular are very conventional. Um, and it's not entirely a bad thing, uh, as we've heard a little bit. Uh, the reason that they're entirely conventional a lot of the time uh, is because of this idea of best practice. Um, so all of the sort of conventional things about games are there because pe the people making the games think that that's the best way to do it. They, they want to make a good game. They don't want to screw up. They want you to have a, have a good time. And so they make the game that way. And it's nice because, you know, it means that they're trying to do a good job. They're trying to let you have fun. Uh, the problem comes when this particular idea of best practice that we see in industry starts to stand in for what games can be at all as a medium. Um, and that's, that's, that's a problem. Uh, so very quickly, talking about best practice, I don't know how many of you will recognize this smiling fellow, um, but this is Jakob Nielsen, who's the father of usability. So one thing that we have with games is that they have this inheritance of usability, um, that they're software and that they should therefore be easy to use, they should be very accessible, so you should be able to just jump in, uh, they should be very learnable so that it's easy to kind of understand what's going on. Um, and then they also inherit things from traditional games, uh, in particular this notion that games should be fair. Uh, so you should always have a decent chance at what you're doing. Uh, you know, the game shouldn't be mean to you in certain ways. Uh, you know, there are certain things you can assume. Um, the other side of the sort of major conventions that we see with games uh, in best practice are the particular kinds of fantasies that play out uh, in these games that we play, particularly the notion that you will be very powerful, you'll be the most important person in the world when you play the game. Uh, it will have a conventional sort of narrative, maybe trying to do a hero's journey, maybe failing or not doing it, as, as Dan said. Uh, and focuses on pleasurable experiences, so not fantasies that are, are not nice. Um, and so all of these things come together and make this sort of best practice idea about what games are meant to be like. 
Um, and the reason for that is the player, uh, not a cat as you can see here, but normally human beings. Um, and it's all, it's all sort of comes out of this conception of the player as a customer or as a consumer of the things that they play, right? So that's our relationship to games is generally as a consumer um, of a media product, if you like. Uh, and this is also part of the heritage uh, of software development and design uh, that video games have. And it's not really surprising because we would like people to buy these games and pay us money so that we can then make more games and then they can pay us and, and it will be happy times forever. But the problem is that this, this relationship to the player is very, very limiting in terms of uh, what we can do uh, with the designs that we create. And what kind of happens is that, that games turn into more of a genre than a medium, if you like. So games turn into this set of very specific stylistic criteria uh, of what they're allowed to be like. And so you get these amazing moments that are generated by games within these sets of criteria. Beautiful landscapes, experiences of space that are absolutely stunning. Uh, amazing experiences of movement through space. Again, this is things that Dan and Jerome touched on about some of the strengths of what we're seeing and how you could maybe work with those strengths. Um, but there are too many of these moments and they're only, you know, this is only two kinds of things. We don't want to just be walking all the time, necessarily. So as Jerome said, you know, what else can we do? Um, and it's easy to get, feel depressed, basically, and think, you know, we're screwed. We, we're never going to be able to make games interesting. It's just going to be walking and shooting and, and making macaroni on the stove uh, in The Sims. And then we complain about it in a talk like this and, you know, feel miserable about everything and, and sad and start crying. And then this would be a perfectly reasonable response for somebody to say, if you keep complaining about the way that games are, uh, if you're so upset about it, why don't you make them yourself and, and make some games and make it happen? And at the start of this year, that's, that was the realization, I guess, that I came to. Um, I can sit here and complain and write about what's interesting about games and what I think is terrible, or I can start making them and see what happens. Uh, and so that's what I decided to do. And this was the first game that I decided to make. It's called Guru Quest. Um, the idea is that you're trying to find out what the meaning of life is, which is you know pretty ambitious for a first game, I thought, but um, I went with it anyway. You know why not? See what happens. Uh, my central motivation with the game is in keeping uh, with a lot of the stuff that Dan and Jerome had said, which is that we run into this problem of kind of static worlds that you go in and everything has been written already, and all you can really do is is follow through on what already exists in the world and uncover it. And I didn't want to do that. I was like, I'm not going to do that. It's not going to be pre-scripted. Um, and this was the very first game I was going to make. So I was like, well, how am I going to do that? That's kind of a stupid idea. Um, but I, I went with it. So the premise of the game is that you leave your house in this very nice kind of landscape. You walk along some hills to a temple uh, where there's a guru sitting. He's that little sort of red thing uh, in the temple there. And you start talking to him by typing in your questions and asking him things like, what does it all mean? You know, what's the meaning of life? Tell me. Um, and you end up having conversations with him. So this is an example conversation uh, that I had with the guru. And he says these kinds of things to you. So actually not a bad conversation with the guru, right? Like it's kind of convincing. Um, you can also have really terrible, absurd conversations with the guru. Of course you can. Um, but it's possible to have these kinds of meaningful conversations. Um, and so this was made with a, a really classic piece of artificial intelligence called Eliza, um, which some of you may have heard of, mm -hmm. which was a chatbot uh, that used to pretend to be a psychoanalyst. And you could sort of talk to it about your problems, and it would ask you questions. And so what I did was modify Eliza to act more like a guru, so that it would say kind of strange things in response to your questions, and, and generally reflect your questions back to you. Um, and this was a really great way to have a more generative conversation. So you can ask anything you want, so there's no limitation on player action. Um, and then you'll get some kind of procedurally generated response from the guru, so that it feels like a conversation. Um, obviously, there are sacrifices uh, that you make by doing this. Um, in particular, you have no control over what the player could say, and you don't actually know what the guru is going to say back. So you're sort of out of the loop a little bit as a designer. Um, and this is where the, the fact that it's a guru is really positive, because if anyone is allowed to say something stupid in response to a question, it's a guru, right? Like they're allowed to say anything. They can, you know, just start talking about the breeze when you ask them what the meaning of life is, and you assume that it's meaningful uh, because they're a guru. So that was a way of getting around that. Um, and so this this first game that I made, um, it's sort of this central interaction between 
the technology that underlies a game system because you know there is code underneath this there's a computer running it uh, and the actual creative output or representation that comes out of the game so there's this little stupid artificial intelligence underneath and then there's this kind of representation of a, co a conversation on top and the interactions between these things and the possible ways that that can play out is what's really can be really interesting about making games and I think one of the first mistakes uh, that people often make when they look at the idea of making games and they look at code you know, as this language that you use to write a game is that you tend to imagine that code is completely expressive and you could say anything that you wanted to in code and that the only limitation is you know, just expressing it. Um, but of course, the underlying technologies that we use hugely affect what we're able to actually do. Right? So the code has its own particular structures and things that it can do well and things that it just can't do. Um, and so you really have to work with the technology that you have. Um, you can actually win Guru Quest, I should say, just quickly. Um, and you do that by being more of a guru than the guru, um, by basically simulating a chatbot yourself. So you respond to the guru as the guru would have responded to himself, basically, and kind of short circuit the whole process and then become the guru. Uh, so it has this sort of really depressing notion of what a guru is. It's basically just a machine that makes particular kinds of comments, which I thought was fantastic. Um, the main other thing that making Guru Quest showed me was that, yes, you know, in six weeks in this instance, I could put together a small kind of manageable game that did something, you know, it was an experience, so it, it could be done. And I was very proud of myself, of course. Um, but it's not like I'm the only person who's trying to do this. You've just heard two other people who, who make really, really amazing games. Um, so there's this community, in fact, of people who are interested in pushing around these boundaries of what games traditionally do and exploring particularly their own personal aesthetics and interests. Um, so I just wanted to give uh, just a small number of examples. You've probably heard of this game. It's called Dinner Date. Uh, Jerome made it. Um, speaking in terms of uh, this idea of best practice that I introduced earlier, this is clearly against the conventional kinds of narratives that we see in games, the conventional kinds of fantasies that we think that games will play out. Um, so it pushes in that way. Here's another game you may have heard of. That's Dear Esther, made by Dan. And again, against this kind of conventional view of narrative and against this kind of conventional view of the kinds of interactivity that you'll have in a game. You just walk. You don't shoot things or hit things or pick things up. Uh, this is a particular sort of, not my favorite game per se, but I'm, I'm glad this game exists. This is Beautiful Escape Dungeoneer. Uh, you should try it out sometime. It's a game about torture as a kind of sexual pleasure, basically. So obviously pushing against conventional understandings of you know, what games are allowed to be about, you know, the propriety that we assume games will have as commercial objects. Uh, this was made by Nicolau, who's a, a very interesting game designer. Uh, against the entire concept of usability are games uh, made by people like Bennett Foddy. Uh, this is Quop. Um, it's a running game, so you're trying to run in a race, but you have to explicitly control all of the muscles in your legs. Uh, and so what happens is it's not very easy and so you have this vision of yourself just falling down over and over again. And it's, it's amazing if you can run for five meters after playing it for an hour. Okay, so not a usable game. Very, very much against this idea of empowerment. Um, and then there are games explicitly against any sense of pleasure in play. So this is Pain Station by Fur uh, Art Entertainment Interfaces. And this is a game that hurts you literally as you play. So it whips your hand, it burns you. Uh, and it electrocutes you while you play, and it's really painful. I, I played it recently, and it hurts, you know, and I stopped playing because it hurt too much. But, you know, it's out there, and it's a game. So th these are pushing these boundaries. And so I decided to make another game, since there's all these other great games out there, and I made a game that's a take on the God game genre. So there's this whole idea of games where you play literally as God in control of the world, and I wanted to make a game about that. And it's called Let There Be Smite. And the image that made me make the game is of the flood, right? So in Genesis, there's a certain point where the world has been running along for some time, and God looks down, and he's pretty disappointed uh, in what's been happening. Things are not going well. Everyone seems to be sinning and doing you know, terrible things. And he's like, well, screw it. And he floods the world, kills everybody except for two people, uh, and then unfloods it, and then starts again. And this is a very game-like response to, to the state of the world, right? Like, I'll just start again. You know, I'm sick of the way that it is now. 
let's get going. And I wanted to build that into the idea of a game. And just this idea of God having this sort of difficult job and feeling you know, irritated by what was going on in the world. So in the game, uh, God sits in front of his kind of retro desktop computer monitoring the world, it looks. And then from time to time, a sin is committed. Um, so in this instance, Zidonius has broken the fourth commandment by breaking the Sabbath. And God has to decide whether he's going to smite this person for that, you know, bad, or forgive them. That's okay, you know, in this instance. And so God makes these decisions. As the population increases, of course, you know, there are more people, there's more sin, and things start to get out of control. And eventually it becomes very difficult to, to, to make these kinds of decisions at all. And eventually God's computer crashes, um, just out of technical necessity, because I couldn't keep putting message boxes on the screen in this instance. So there's a sin overflow and you restart the game. Uh, and of course your other option is to flood the world and start again. So just kill everyone, let's try again, you know, didn't go so well. Um, so as a joke, obviously, this game works pretty well. It's kind of a funny idea and, you know, it plays through in the game. Uh, what was a revelation for me about the game is that it did actually create a deeper relationship uh, to the kinds of morality that you can represent in a game. So it wasn't just a joke, as it turned out. I thought it was. So running through it again, uh, you start playing the game. Uh, somebody commits a sin. You read what they did. You know, they broke the Sabbath. Okay, how do I feel about that? Uh, it's okay. I'll forgive them all. No, no. No breaking the Sabbath. Smite. That's fine. And then there's a few more and they're starting to come a little bit faster. So you're reading, you know, reading faster, like, oh, Sabbath, smite, uh, what's this one? Dishonoring their father, forgive, doesn't matter. Um, so you're already a little bit compromised in your decision making. You have to go faster than you might have wanted to. But now it's getting harder and harder, and the experience that you get around this stage is, I don't really have time to read these things. I only have time to make a sweeping generalization about what kind of God I am. You know, I'm a vengeful God, or I'm a forgiving God and I'll just always hit smite or I'll always hit forgive and I'll deal with it that way, you know, kind of generalizing morality. And then at this point, it changes again. You don't even have time to do that. You don't even have time to look for which one is the smite button or the forgive button. You just start clicking buttons crazily trying to like get rid of all of this and just deal with it. And now your morality is completely gone, right? You're not even making decisions. You're just trying to make things go away. So it was interesting to me that a simple game like that could lead to that kind of experience of morality and that kind of corruption uh, could happen. Uh, so this, this notion of games as this kind of conduit for thoughtfulness, even in this small form, uh, was very encouraging. Um, and in fact, there is a tradition of wanting to do this kind of design work, to push away from the mainstream in order to achieve certain aesthetic effects or kinds of intellectual effects. And like, I don't want to get into a whole big academic discourse about this, but I did want to touch on just a couple of interesting examples of that. Uh, so the first one is critical design. Uh, this is uh, come up with by a guy called Anthony Dunn. Um, and he's an industrial designer, so he creates actual physical objects, um, but has very similar problems, that there are these ideas about the way that physical objects are supposed to be and that as a designer, you end up feeling funneled into making them that way. Um, and so, uh, to quote Dunn here, um, are conventional notions of user friendliness compatible with aesthetic experience? Uh, perhaps with aesthetics, a different path must be taken. An aesthetic approach must, might subsume and subvert the idea of user friendliness and provide an alternative model of interactivity. So already we see this kind of same idea of like, maybe we have to break with these certain forms of best practice in order to achieve something different than what we have right now. Break with usability, achieve some aesthetics. Um, coming from human-computer interaction, there's this notion of uh, ludic design by a designer called Bill Gaver, who's uh, a, an amazing person. And he notes that software, because he's a software designer, comes from this tradition of work and sees that that is part of the problem um, of how, why software turns out the way it does. And he says this, uh, as computing has emerged from the office and laboratory, it seems to have brought along the values of the workplace, concerns for clarity, efficiency, and productivity, a preoccupation with finding solutions to problems. Uh, it's as if they mirror only the ethnographic view that ordinary life requires work to achieve and neglect the joyful, poetic, and spiritually rewarding nature of the lives we might find. And so again, we see this thing of you know this work or usability and being productive 
is kind of infiltrating uh, what we think that we can do and we lose aesthetics uh, in the process. And video games have clearly, clearly inherited some of the same work-like interactions uh, as forming part of what they can do. So we're very interested in effectiveness, discrete agency, control, and all of these sorts of ideas in our games as well as in our software products. Uh, and so very oddly, we should probably try and reappropriate <coughs> this notion of playfulness from the software designer back into games, which is a, a surprise that we should need to do that. Uh, finally, and, and briefly, just wanted to talk about a colleague of mine, uh, Doug Wilson, along with Miguel Sicat, who I uh, work with at ITU, have this idea of dialogic design, uh, which was previously called abusive design, actually. Um, and what they wanted to do is position against this notion of user-centered design, where you obsess over the relationship between a player and the game, and away from the sort of auteur forms of art practice, where the main thing is the relationship between the artist and the object, and think more in terms of a dialogue between the creator and the person uh, interacting with the creation. Uh, and Doug says that this is a design strategy uh, that aims to nurture a feeling of playful, agonistic back and forth between designer and user. In its stronger form, this back and forth can be literal, uh, as in the case of designers and players who know each other personally, uh, but it can also be figurative, uh, an illusion or feeling of dialogue in the interaction. And so again, once again, Doug rejecting the kind of conventional understandings of what these interactions should be uh, and trying to uh, look at this in terms of dialogue. Uh, which gives me a segue to the next game uh, that I made, which is called Safety Instructions. Um, although I didn't design it with dialogic uh, design in mind, I think it can be read that way. Um, and basically it's a typing game set on a crashing plane where you're going to die unless you uh, react, react properly. And it's based, of course, on those sorts of things that you see on the airplane where it tells you how to buckle your seatbelt and so on. Um, so for each situation, uh, you're given your situation and then the command that you need to type in properly in order to survive, basically, so that you don't die within a time limit with soothing music playing in the background. Um, and so if you do it, then you survive. Um, so you buckle your seatbelt, then you don't die at that instant, at least, and you progress on. If you don't do it, you die. Um, and the interesting thing about dying in this game is that it's much more interesting to die than to live uh, because the animations are way, way more interesting and exciting. Obviously, you know, dying in a plane crash looks pretty spectacular. So you fly up off your chair, you hit your head on the ceiling, blood pours out of your head, and then you slump down. And so it's desirable to die. You know, everyone wants to die in this game over and over again, which is interesting. Um, so I released this game, uh, and I included a bunch of bonus levels and a, a very hard difficulty level. Um, and at the end of the very hard difficulty level, there was a stage that you couldn't win. There was too much text and not enough time, so you couldn't type it in, so you would always die at the end. This chair would fall down on you and crush you. Um, so I released it, and within a day or so, somebody sent me an email saying, I beat the final level and the game crashed. And I was like, oh, you know, okay, so people can beat the level that I designed to not be beatable. Um, and they did it by cheating. They, they just got their computer to type impossibly fast, basically. Um, and so I was like, fine. So then I had to make you know, another level after that level that was taking into account these people who played uh, in that way. And so you can see very clearly a dialogue starts being taken up between designer and player with the game in the middle as the kind of conversation topic. Um, and then in sort of other ways, dialogues around the game, um, for instance, a guy in Thailand, of all places, um, made sound files for every single uh, level in the game. So he recorded all of these, you know, buckle your seatbelt, and sent them to me as MP3s and said, you know, if you want to have some narration in your game, I've done that for you, which is really amazing, you know. So again, dialogue, it's, it's great. Um, it was also the first game that I made that drew any real attention from the blog world or, or whoever it is that gives us attention uh, in this life. And in particular, it was uh, featured on a site called IndieGames.com, where indie games go, I guess. And this started making me wonder, so, oh, so am I an indie game maker then? Is, is that who I am? Is that what I'm doing? And I started wondering, you know, what, you know, what am I doing? You know, I'm making games that I'm wanting to make, but do I have some sort of identity? Um, and so I just wanted to look at some of those sorts of identities that, that, that maybe you could take on. Uh, and again, Drone and Dan, Dan have tackled this a little bit, so I won't... Uh, go into too much detail. Uh, one idea is this idea of not games um, from Tale of Tales' Aurea Harvey and Michael Salmon, who made The Graveyard, among other very interesting narrative games. 
Uh, and if you just read the greatest hits of their quotes, um, they're quite disgusted and really disappointed by the way that games have been used as a, as a medium. And they have this one quote that I, I love, which is that they say that they looked at commercial games and they said it was as if somebody took a big brush and scribbled a tic-tac-toe grid over Botticelli's Birth of Venus. So just, you know, this is not a good thing. This is like really crass use of an art form, basically. And instead, they're much more interested in things like world creation uh, in particular. And, and in their placing narratives into those worlds, um, which is fantastic, and they do great work, but clearly wasn't what I was doing, so I, I kept looking. Um, there's this notion of art games, uh, which is perhaps you know games could dare to go for big A expressiveness and like be like art, proper art, and uh, and that kind of thing. Not so many people operate under that explicitly, um, but it does. You know the word gets thrown around. Um, an iconic image of that would be uh, Jason Rohrer's Passage, uh, which you can see on the slide here. That's been you know, classically regarded as one of the, the real successes of making a, an arty kind of game. And Jason Rohrer's Passage is particularly interesting because it does what it does uh, in a kind of procedural way. So it's kind of this emotional procedurality. It really does engage with the underlying idea of a computer and how a computer system works and how a game works as well as the, uh, the top level kind of aesthetics uh, that, that you can achieve. Um, and obviously there's the whole can games ever be art discussion that we don't have to get into unless we want to. And it can be productive or it can be a total waste of time. So we'll see. But I definitely don't want to say that I'm an artist. Like that seems a bit too, oh, it's very serious. So I'm not going to be an artist. So I, I refuse that. Uh, going in a totally different uh, direction, there's this idea of serious games. Um, which is kind of a, an amazing name for anything, serious games. And the idea behind serious games is pushing the medium of games beyond entertainment and doing something worthwhile with games. You know? So not just being entertainment and everyone wasting their time for 20 hours, uh, but teaching them something or helping uh, victims of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, or all these kinds of approaches uh, to what games could possibly do. And it, it has this rhetoric of nobility and you know, reforming the medium and doing something positive. Uh, serious games, however, generally ends up kind of tied in knots uh, because they're trying to be serious, obviously, and then they're trying to be fun at the same time. And in the sort of scrabble to ma maintain both of those positions at the same time, I think the main thing that they tend to, to lose is playfulness. Uh, it, it generally doesn't feature in these sorts of games. And that's definitely not what I wanted to be doing. Um, so I've sort of rejected three traditions now. And I thought, well, again, you know, if I'm just going to go around rejecting ideas that I don't want, maybe I should come up with something myself. And so this was my attempt. Um, basically, I was talking about this with my wife one day. And I, was, I was like, what am I doing? And she was like, I think that you're making curious games. That was her, her term, not mine. Uh, and the phrase really resonated with me. And I thought, that's a, that's a pretty cool phrase. I can use that. That's a good brand. Uh, that kind of thing. I'll write a book and, and make a million dollars. Um, but in talking about this now, at the very least, until I trademark it later, um, the intention isn't really to, to say that this is a movement or a manifesto or some kind of, this is the way that you should make games uh, or anything like that, um, but just to try and start framing a, a different kind of attitude that we could take uh, to games and game making. Cute kitten. Um, so the main thing that I felt about some of the movements that kind of exist um, already is that they're quite strident about the sorts of things that games should be doing. And I really wanted to soften the rhetoric surrounding that. So I didn't want to be making bold claims. And a word like curious, I think, really helps to, to soften the idea of what you're trying to do. Um, so curious is good that way, um, but it's good for a lot of other reasons. Um, and just going through a couple of simple dictionary definitions, uh, one meaning can be eager to learn or know or inquisitive, which helps to maintain this idea that, yes, games could actually be productive in the sense of, of learning style engagement, without, but without the seriousness. So just throw away the seriousness, uh, and that would be great. Another definition is arousing or exciting speculation, interest or attention through being inexplicable uh, or highly unusual. And so this helps us with this idea that we might want to move away from conventional perspectives. So Curious has got that going for it. Uh, and a third definition, which I love and which is very helpful, is prying or meddlesome. Um, so it has the sense of sort of mischievousness and that you could do things that you're not supposed to do and that they might be a little bit annoying, uh, which I, I, I love doing in my own games, uh, basically. I like to annoy people a little bit uh, with the games. Um, so crucially, we get this connotation of playfulness rather than seriousness or importance, 
we get questions rather than answers, uh, and we maybe get teasing rather than pleasing. So I think that it, it takes us in some good directions as a word. Um, at the same time, it's not just sort of this whimsical ha 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 running through a meadow playing around like a lamb idea. There's also a seriousness involved in curiosity. It's just a different kind. Um, and the psychologist, uh, William James, who you can see staring between the words there, um, couldn't think of a better word to try and explain what the sort of heart of cognition was for, for humans. And he said that curiousness was the impulse toward better cognition in its full extent. Um, and that in its higher, more intellectual form, this impulse toward completer knowledge takes the character of scientific or philosophic curiosity. So you can kind of take it to these heightened planes as well if you want to. So you've got a lot of flexibility is all I'm saying, and, uh, and that's a good thing. So curiosity can also be the exciting part of life, you know, the really productive part of life. Um, on a more practical note, um, I think that there's also this notion of the curio, um, so making it into a, a real object, basically. So a curio is, is generally defined as some unusual article, object of art, etc., valued as a curiosity. Um, and curios in particular give you a number of interesting practical uh, ideas about what a curious game could be. Uh, in particular, they tend to be small. So you can see a bunch of them in, a, in an Apocathory's uh, drawer here. Um, and the way that I've started thinking about this, again, my wife comes up with most of the good ideas, so um, this was her idea as well, is that you could make games that are more like blog posts than novels. Um, so with a blog post, you write it quickly, it has one particular idea, and it goes out there very, you know, it goes out there and everyone can react to it, and it's, it's, you know, and then there's another blog post, and then there's another blog post. With a novel, obviously, you have to work a lot harder for a lot longer, and then you put it out. So this notion of small scale is, is productive, I think. Uh, with curios, you also have the idea of a collector. Um, so there's a person who is pursuing their own personal aesthetic. You know, like they, they are the one who decides what brings all of these objects into one cohesive collection. Um, and that idea, I think, you know, the designer as a collector of interesting aesthetic objects is, is a really good way to go when we're, uh, when we're making games. And of course, curios are oddities. They're, uh, they're unconventional. Uh, they're conversation starters. They don't have to be functional or, you know, particularly impressive in themselves. They work partly as part of, of a whole. So these are all connotations that I like a lot. Um, then you could ask, well, so who is meant to be curious in all of this? Like you've sort of gone on about curiousness, but who's curious? Um, and I think anything, any, any aspect of this process could have this applied to it, which is uh, as part of my philosophy here. So the game, we can say, is curious. The game itself, in the sense of a curio, because it's an unusual object. Um, but we could anthropomorphize and say, you know, the game is asking questions. The game is wondering about things uh, if we want to. Clearly, the player should be considered as being one of the partners in this, so the player could be curious. The game could make the player curious. Uh, and for me personally, the most important thing has tended to be that the designer is curious. So the person making the game is curious about what they are doing in the first place. Um, so that's enough uh, sort of philosophizing. So I decided to make a game that everyone would hate and nobody would be interested in uh, in the slightest and it's called The Artist is Present. Um, and so the impetus for this game comes pretty directly from the art world, which is interesting in terms of the games as art debate. Uh, and it's this uh, performance by Marina Abramovich, who's an amazing uh, performance artist. She went to the Museum of Modern Art uh, at a big, a big show of hers, and she sat in a chair. She's in the red dress. And there was a chair opposite her, and the work was that you could go to the museum, pay your money, obviously, and then sit with her. You would sit opposite her, and you, the only thing that you did was that you both stared into each other's eyes for as long as you wanted, and when you were finished, you got up and left. And then she stayed there all day, and people came and sat and looked into her eyes, left for all day for a month. So she did it for a very long time, eight hours a day, six days a week. Um, and you know, reading about this performance, I was like, well, clearly there needs to be a game version of this, because there just does. And this is a really important part of making games for me, is that you know, part of what you're doing when you make a game is just making something exist. It needs to be in the world. You know, if somebody sees the artist is present, then there should be a game version of the artist is present, just because that's funny, at least. At least it's funny. So we have this image. So we make it into a game, like that. Uh, and there it is. Okay, so there's your game. Two people sitting in chairs. That's great. But you don't really get to do anything, right? Because, you know, they're staring into each other's eyes, and it's all the same, but nothing's happening. Um, 
and that was a problem because I wanted it to be a game. I didn't want it to be a picture. Uh, so I was doing research uh, while I was trying to make the game, research into the performance, and one thing that becomes very clear when you read about the artist is present, the performance, is that for the person attending the show, the performance is getting to the chair because it, she's a very famous artist and it was a very popular artwork and to sit with her, you had to arrive around 5.30 in the morning, wait till the museum opened at 10.30 in the morning, queue for another few hours and then maybe you would get to sit opposite her, assuming that for instance somebody didn't decide to sit there for eight hours that day and then you just didn't get the chance. Uh, so that's great, so there's this performance that the, the participant is going through as well and so that's what uh, the game became about. So you turn up at the museum, uh, the museum needs to be open, uh, if the museum is closed you can't go through the doors, uh, it works on New York time, so if you have time zone issues, then that causes problems as well, of course. It's not open on Thanksgiving, as I discovered uh, just the other day. You go and buy a ticket, which costs 25 US dollars. Some players complained about this, amazingly, even though they didn't actually have to pay the money. But, you know, there you go. They'll complain about anything. Uh, you walk into the exhibition hall, walk past some famous artworks that I couldn't resist drawing in pixel graphics, you know, because it just looks fantastic. Uh, it's better than the original, probably. Uh, and then eventually you get to the back of the queue. Um, so you join the queue, because obviously if there's a queue, you join the queue and start waiting. Um, and the game follows very severe rules uh, about queuing, so you can't push people. If you start pushing people, then you get thrown out of the museum. Uh, if you wait for too long when the queue moves up, um, then somebody will just shove you out of the way and take your place. So you have to like be paying attention to what you're doing. And you have to wait, obviously. It takes, on average, about 20 minutes per person for the queue to move. So you're waiting for a long, long time. Um, and it moves very slowly. So at some point, you might be like, I'm just going to find out what I'm waiting for in the first place. So you leave the queue, and you walk and see, what are these people waiting for? And eventually, you get to the front of the queue. And you see that you're waiting to sit in a chair opposite somebody. And at this point, you have a certain sort of crisis. Like, is that worth doing? Do I want to go to the back of this queue again and wait for however long it's going to take to sit in a chair. And you know, this is a great moment to come to in a video game. Like, what is it worth it to me? What does it mean? Like, this is a game. It's telling me I should sit in the chair. But should I? Like, why? So you ask yourself questions. And of course, you know, I released it and nobody really wanted to play it. But, uh, but I thought that I should. So I played the game. Um, and it took five hours. So I joined the queue in the morning, actually in the afternoon, because I was in Denmark. And for five hours, I kind of made dinner, and I watched TV, and tried to go to the bathroom, looking out the door to make sure that the queue hadn't moved, and all of these sorts of things. And it turned out to be a very intense experience. It was like crazy how intense the experience was. Uh, and that was really awesome. It's a really positive thing that you could have this intense experience of waiting in a queue. Who knew that that could be so amazing? And you know, just to prove that I made it, although I guess I could have fabricated the screenshot, uh, that's me sitting in the chair opposite Marina Abramovich. And there is a special screen that you get when you sit down, but I'm not going to show it to you, obviously, because you have to wait in the queue yourselves. Um, and other people have shared with me, the few, the sort of you know five to ten people who have ever finished this game, did share with me how much it had meant to them when they did it. They thought it was a, a moving and interesting experience that they had committed to it, and that was exciting, uh, of all things. So obviously this is a game that everyone would hate. But the weird thing about this game is that it, it, went, it was huge on the internet. Uh, it was very, very surprising. Um, the culmination of that was that the Museum of Modern Art themselves tweeted about the game and told people, yes, you should play this, this ridiculous reproduction of, uh, of an artwork. And so it was this big hit. Um, and you know, obviously, that's very flattering and everything. Um, but the, the interesting thing about it for me is that it broke certain pre-established ideas that I had. One, this assumption that nobody would think that this was worth worthwhile or interesting, and two, that the kinds of people who might be interested in it would be limited only to sort of hardcore gamers, when in fact the opposite was kind of the fact that the mainstream gaming press wasn't super interested in it, but places like the Huffington Post and the Village Voice were interested in it, so it, it hit this different kind of uh, demographic, which was, which was fantastic and showed me that you know, other people are interested in engaging with these kinds of ideas. Um, so, you know, great, so you have one sort of weirdly successful game, but you have to keep going, so I kept making games. Made, this, is, this was my big failure game, fortunately, it had to happen eventually, it's called Trolley Problem, it's about ethics in games. Nobody really played it, uh, nobody was that interested in it at all, a uh, few people were interested. I already played. 
You've played it, so we've got one person. I haven't played it, so you're the only person. Um, but it really emphasized for me the importance of having some people that you can talk to when you're making games, because I did have this community of other people that I was like, hey, I, I made this game, and they're like, that's really interesting. And then you know, nobody else cares, but at least some, somebody said it was interesting. Uh, then I made another game. Uh, it's a dancing game based on the movie Zorba the Greek. Uh, and this one was pushing against fairness in games, so you can't win because he's a better dancer than you are. The best that you could ever do is be as good as he is, and then you would have a draw with Zorba the Greek. And so it had this interesting idea of you know, competition in the context of brotherly love, because the movie is all about how much these two guys really like each other and how dancing brings them together. Here it's really competitive and divisive. Um, and this is the most recent game that I've managed to, to put together, All's Well That Ends Well. Uh, I released it on Monday. Um, and this was all about accessibility. So in a lot of mainstream games, you have the sensation that it doesn't really matter what you do. You'll win in the end. If you just keep kind of plodding forwards, eventually you're just going to win um, because the game wants you to win. And so I wanted to make a total exaggeration of that, basically, where you can't help winning this game even though you basically just have a terrible, terrible time and keep crashing your plane over and over and over again. So that's that game. Uh, so quickly, just to sort of wind up, I'm doing very well on time, you'll be pleased to know. Um, I just wanted to have a quick look at the story of Curious Games so far and, and think about just some of the stuff that happened. Um, so this idea of the curious designer, I think, is really, really a, a good way to go um, for making games. Uh, being curious about making games and what they could be like and just making them and sort of, that's it, you know, that's the process. It's not complicated, it just kind of happens. And you can be curious about all sorts of things as a designer. Um, in particular, you can find yourself wondering about the relationships between the technical aspects of your project and the aesthetic aspects of your project. Uh, you can wonder whether you can even make a game of the thing that you're thinking about, and then somehow you come up with a way. Um, you can notice how the meaning of a game changes when you actually play it versus when you thought of what you were going to do. You can think about how the players are going to react, of course. Um, a fairly natural thing that happens, I guess, when somebody new like me starts in a medium is that you make games about the medium or you make paintings about painting, you make games about games. Because it's interesting to probe what the sort of borders of the medium that you're making are. Uh, so I make a lot of games at the moment that are mostly about what games are and what video games have tended to do um, because that's just interesting to me. I don't plan on doing that forever, but for a little while longer perhaps. Um, so being curious about your medium is a really good thing to do. And to make things within that medium that probe those questions is a good way to address that. Um, the notion of curious players, I've been really pleased to find that some people play my games and kind of get what I was trying to do. And they're like, you know, I understand. That's interesting. You know, that was a good thing to have done. They have the experience. So that's very positive. I think turning that around in a way that we don't do enough, though, this notion of curious players I think it's important that players themselves take some responsibility uh, in this whole thing of playing games. I think we get coddled too much and people are just trying to feed us stuff instead of making us work a little bit more. And so the idea of curious players should also be the idea that we as players should try to be more curious when we play games. I think that that's really important, that we be more demanding and curious as well. Um, it was a big surprise to me that anyone played any of my, my games because they're kind of not proper games. And in general, in particular, they're generally not fair and they're generally not that much to do in them. Um, but people played them and they, they got a kick out of it. I kind of, the moment when I knew that the games were very accessible was when I found a forum on the internet where new mothers were all playing safety instructions and talking to each other about, uh, you know, I tried to get the kids out of the room so I could play another round of safety instructions and, uh, and that kind of thing. So these sorts of audiences are, are playing these games. On the other hand, I will just say that my games are small, free, on the web, and you know, games. So it's also the case that you know, it's not like I'm making the best thing ever and people are fighting to, to play it. It's very easy to access these games. But that's also a positive thing. Um, I think one of the most important things that has come out of this is this notion that making small games that, that don't take very long to make, I, I tend to spend four to six weeks making these games, uh, that their smallness isn't at a disadvantage and they're kind of being able to express an idea. It's like this blog post thing. Like you can write a blog post that, that conveys something really well, and you can make a small game that conveys an idea in an interesting way. 
um, one particularly nice response to the dancing game that I made, Zorba, this person wrote to me and they said, I'm sitting here defeated, stripped bare, reduced to an insignificant, rhythmless nobody. I just had a little chuckle to myself, part, partly out of sheer hopelessness, partly out of annoyance at myself for taking this so seriously. So this idea is that people can deeply engage with small games. So that's really important too. Um, finally, just talking about sort of the surrounding atmosphere of making, making games and making these kinds of games uh, is that there is this community out there, particularly of bloggers actually. There's this tradition now of game journalism and game criticism where people are really probing deeply into what games mean, what's happening in these popular games, what's happening in indie games and so on. So there are all of these great voices speaking about games uh, in blogs in particular. And increasingly, there are all of these great voices speaking about games by making games as well. And that's something to really be cherished and to be increased uh, as well, so that we can have this conversation, not just in words, but in games too. Uh, my final point is that making games is not actually as hard as you would think. And so if you don't already make games, I wonder if maybe you should start making games, getting a bit curious about it and saying, you know, screw it, I'll make that game about that funny thing that happened to me last week. Uh, and, you know, join the party. We need all the voices that we can get. And uh, I hope to see some of your games uh, one of these days. Thanks.